In the interest of staying on time, I'm going to head and get us started, despite the people continue to walk through. It's nice to see such a large turnout. It's a pleasure, my personal pleasure, to introduce Tom Ockray from the Department of Biological and Environmental Sciences. My department is a pleasure. Um, Tom is an evolutionary and eco ecological biologist. He has done work at the Savannah River Ecology Lab, which was and continues to be a world-renowned ecology research facility. He, and in his hometown. Yeah, so I had to mention it. Aiken, South Carolina. So, this is Tom's sixth year at Longwood. He currently has a rather sizable externally funded grant studying turtles in Northern Virginia and into Western Virginia. Uh, work that he involves Longwood undergraduates in during the summer and during the year. And I believe that's going to be a good bit of what he talks about today as he tells us about turtles, why we should care about them if we don't, and why we should keep caring about them. Tom Ockray. Thank you very much. So, you know, when you were in kindergarten and you played show and tell, I think that's probably the most important way to start. Uh, Brett said that I have a grant studying turtles, and I've been studying wood turtles, that's what this is right here, or the remnants of a wood turtle, for, for over a decade now. It's been my passion to do that, and along the way, I've got passionate, become passionate about all things turtle. So I tell my students, and I'll tell you that as a biologist, I view turtles as model organisms for the investigation of lots of different aspects of evolution, ecology, environmental science, and uh, molecular biology and so forth. I want to pass this around to you. As I said, this is a wood turtle. It's a female, uh, or what is left of a female, that we found in December. She was given to us by some landowners when we discovered a new population. This is an endangered species, and we discovered a new population. The old timers that lived there told us that they had found her in a fence, in an American wire fence, about this far off the ground. She was out in a field probably a couple hundred meters away from a creek. She had been out there presumably on a nesting foray and was looking for a place to nest, found a place she liked, decided she had to get over a fence and then got trapped in it as she, came, as she went through it. So I'll pass this around so you can see in your own hands why I think and I hope you believe that turtles should be a cause for wonder. I mean, for example, isn't this a cause for wonder? Whenever I, whenever I talk to my students about turtles or about biology in general, I'm always interested in adaptations. And the fact that this turtle from southeastern China and northeastern Vietnam has four ocelli on its head, four eye spots on the back of its head, is not easily explainable, but certainly is wonderful. I want to finish the talk telling you why I think they're a cause for concern. So the first way to start is by fable, or ultimately by allegory, right? We all know the story of the tortoise and the hare. And I want to convey to you all that I believe that the story of the tortoise and the hare, whereby the tortoise wins the race because it does what? It takes its time. Is in parallel to the life history, that is the way turtles live, and the evolutionary history, that is the way all of them have lived uh, for turtles. Turtles have been around for a long, long time, and they've been doing their thing the same way, more or less, for a long, long time. And that's one of the ways that they have made it so far, so long. So Alfred Sherwood Rover, who is a very important evolutionary biologist and vertebrate ecologist and discovered lots of different dinosaur species, said that because they're still living, turtles are commonplace objects. Most people think of turtles as commonplace objects, but were they extinct, their shells, the most remarkable defensive armor ever assumed by a tetrapod, a four-legged vertebrate, would be a cause for wonder. And in fact, it would be a cause for wonder. Turtles' commonplaceness in our world trivializes the fact that this architecture, which is, you all are passing around, is so extraordinary. Turtles are the only organisms that have wrapped their pelvis and their shoulders inside their rib cage, right? Inside their rib cage. About 40% of their body mass is actually their ribs, which are fused to protect them. And as I said, they've been doing this in one way or another 
for a long, long, long time, and it has served them well. They are the most conspicuous tetrapod that we know of, four-legged vertebrate that we know of, easily recognizable as a turtle. They are survivors in armor, I would, I would say, and people have named books as survivors in armor. They are very different from all other organisms that we know. We consider them to be reptiles, but they are very divergent from most other reptiles. They're monophyletic, meaning that they all living turtles and all fossil turtles that we know of share a common ancestor. And they've existed for at least 210 million years. The earliest known turtles that we know of now are about 220 million years. They've been doing this for a long, long time. They've actually survived two great mass extinctions, the one that gave rise to the dinosaurs and then the one that ultimately extinguished the dinosaurs. So something about what they've been doing is very successful in light of the numerous different genera and families and species that were, were driven extinct by uh, these mass extinctions. So here's Proganochiles, the, the earliest known turtle turtle, right? I mean, this is the first fossil at about 210 million years of what it means to be a turtle from the Triassic of Germany. So they've survived, they survived the Triassic extinction, the one that I told you that led to the conditions that favored the explosion of the dinosaurs. The, the lizard kings, the reptile rulers of the world. They survived that. The one that was caused by volcanoes, most likely. They also survived the KT boundary, right? The one that we know of that was caused by a meteor impacting the planet somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Yucatan. The one that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. They've lived through both of those. This is the one that changed the world that made us able to be having this conversation, right? I'm the worst thing that ever happened in this world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is true, right? This meteorite, <laughs> in, symbolically, is what led to the rise of mammals and ultimately human beings. So where do turtles fit in the tree of life? Right, turtles are testudines that includes everything you might call a turtle, a tortoise, a terrapin, or a turtle. They have historically been called reptiles. That's been debated. They are different than most other living reptiles in that they do not have <coughs> what are called temporal openings or temporal fenestra. They have these post-temporal fenestra. Most other reptiles have two openings. They're called diapsids in their temporal lobe. So that makes them different than most other reptiles. That makes them potentially more closely related to these two other groups that we call pariasaurs and prochlophonids. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Prochlophonids are anapsids. They have this the no temporal openings, but these big post-temporal fenestra. They're like a two-meter lizard-like thing from the mid-Triassic. We think that they might be related to them. We also think they might be related to the pariasaurs. Pariasaurs didn't survive that Triassic, Jurassic extinction, but they had lots of features in common with turtles. They had that anapsid skull, but they also had lots of horny and bony plates that make them similar to turtles. We're not sure if, in fact, that's what they're related to, because some people have argued that those features and turtle features may be convergent. In fact, most recent modern genetic work, most recent modern genetic work on living reptiles and turtles suggest that turtles actually are secondarily derived diapsids. That is, they've lost that opening. Um, they are closely related to rep other reptiles and not these guys. That means that they probably share common ancestor with this group called Sarcopterygians, the plesiosaurs, Nessie, right? Loch Ness. And I put this up here because just two years ago, the oldest known living turtle was discovered, well, was published on this discovery in marine sediments from China 220 million years ago with a well-developed plastron, bony armor in the <coughs> bottom of its, or the ventral side of its body, but not on the dorsal side, odontochelys. Not too different in some ways from a plesiosaur, right? 
So Odontochelys is the oldest known living turtle that we know of today from marine sediments in China and probably gave rise to, or at least was along the lineage of all living turtles. Damn, that's good. What's interesting is, is that shortly after Odontochelys is found in about two, 210 million years, we have Progeochelys, that one that is like a robust tortoise-like animal. So within a short, short 10 million years in terms of evolutionary history and geologic history, we get a well-developed turtle with a carapace as well. And then just a, a few more million years later, and we've got two other ancestral type turtles which lived, which gave rise to the other types of turtles that we see today. So they've already started to diversify, diversify and become very different and very turtle-like within a blink of a <coughs> geologic eye. So those, there's Progenochelys again, just so to remind you how different they became so quickly. What's also interesting about turtles is that within a short period of time, they, and across their history, they've gone from, they went from being marine, Odontochelys, to being terrestrial, right, Proganochelys <coughs> and Paleocursus and Protocursus, to being marine, or excuse me, to being aquatic again, that's all modern living turtles, except for the tortoises, right? So they, there have been several iterations of out to sea, back to land, out to sea, back to land. And today, turtles are known from all continents except Antarctica. There's about 320 species in about 14 families, including the sea turtles. They are no, the fossils are known from Antarctica. There are, there are three families of primitive turtles and 11 families of more or less derived so the primitive families are the pleurodires, the ones with a neck that pulls into the side, and the derived families are the ones that you know of, <coughs> the box turtles and painted turtles and snapping turtles, the ones that can hide their necks. Right? So a pleurodire is a primitive turtle, so to speak, because it can't pull its head in and hide its head. But a cryptodire can pull its head in and protect its neck and head. What's interesting about this is that we have about three <coughs> families of pleurodires living today, the South American, the giant South American river turtles, the African swamp and river and pond turtles, and then the snake neck turtles from South America and Australia. This is the Mata Mata turtle, which crawls on the bottom of rivers and lakes in South America. It can actually open its hyoid bone and its neck, expand it so quickly that it draws in a large volume of water and sucks the fish in and then spits it back out. It's its way of capturing food. The pleurodires are actually known from lots of other different groups that are known that are from fossils from North America and Africa and the rest of the world. And we think that these guys are relictual. That is, this small group of turtles is more or less relic of, of the different places and niches that they have to find. That's different than from the cryptodires, which we know of as the sea turtles. The regular sea turtles and the leatherback sea turtle. The alligator snapping turtle, the one that lures fish with its tongue. The soft shell turtles, like Odontochelys with a well-developed plastron, but not a well-developed carapace. Coretochelys, which swims like a sea turtle. It's known from lagoons from Australia and New Guinea, but actually swims like a sea turtle. A South American river turtle that's all by itself, just known from Yucatan and so forth in that area. Whoops. The stink pots from around here, this big headed turtle which lives in mountain streams in China, Southeast China. <coughs> this turtle lives in streams that are almost vertical, like mountain streams, and it just climbs right up. In fact, one argument is that its head is so large is in, in order to, to cantilever its movement uphill. So it can use its body to climb up rocks. The painted turtles like we have in ponds around here. The Asian painted turtles, or the Asian pond turtles, like this river turtle from Southeast Asia, Sumatra and Borneo, and then the tortoises, right? So pretty diverse, relatively speaking, compared to the pleurodires. If we look at evolutionary <coughs> development of these two groups, we see that 
The derived turtles, notice the color here, the color scale here, the color ramp here is warmer, is more derived, and cooler is less derived. The derived turtles are in the northern hemisphere, and the primitive turtles are more or less in the southern hemisphere. This is work that I've been doing both as a postdoc and for the last several years while I'm here. So this is a measure of evolutionary development by counting branches on an evolutionary tree. And this fits perfectly with the breakup of the supercontinent of Pangaea between about 200 and 150 million years ago. So between about 200 and 150 million years ago, the continent, supercontinent split into Laurasia and Gondwana land, and the Gondwana land turtles are the side necks, and the Laurasian turtles are the hidden neck turtles. Now, there are plenty of hidden neck turtles today in the southern hemisphere continents, but they've all more or less gotten there secondarily. And along the way, what's interesting as well is all of these different groups have done lots of different things. So for example, we see that there are tortoises over here. We see that there are the pleurodires over here and the cryptodires here, and that they may occupy a set of niches in an estuary or a pond or a stream or a fast flowing river today. But <coughs> along the way, they've occupied lots of different, I'll actually use the laser pointer, lots of different habitats. So being a certain kind of turtle doesn't mean that you've been doing the same thing <coughs> along your evolutionary history. That's pretty interesting. Another incredible turtle is this horned turtle called Myelania. Myelania is known from fossils about 80 million years old all the way up to about 2,000 years ago in New Caledonia. Who knows where New Caledonia is? A few of us, right? New Caledonia is north of New Zealand and east of Australia. Right? So it's a Gondwana land, uh, continental island. It's owned by the French today. It has lots of the southern hemisphere flora and fauna. Apparently, people didn't arrive there until about 2,000. And right around the time that people arrived on New Caledonia, there were still these horned turtles on New Caledonia that went extinct thousands or millions of years beforehand in Australia and millions and millions of years beforehand in South America. So these guys are known from several different places around the Southern Hemisphere. South America, Australia, islands off the coast, of Australia, New Caledonia, New Zealand, and so forth. We think <coughs> that because of their, their architecture that they were tortoise-like, but their placement on some of these islands suggests that in fact some of them may have been marine or seafaring. So in other words, there may have been marine horned <coughs> turtles. And they may have actually been able to swim some of these islands, and we may have them fossilized on those islands because they were captured in the marine sediments nearby. But an alternative hypothesis is, is possible. It's possible that they rafted to those islands. This is a photograph of a, an Aldabra tortoise that arrived on the coast of Tanzania near Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, in 2004, after it had rafted at least 740 kilometers from the Aldabra Islands. Notice the white stuff on its legs? covered in barnacles because it had been adrift at sea for so long. So this was, this, was, this was one of the first examples of rafting that was documented and evidenced and was indisputable. We think that these tortoises are able to make these long oceanic voyages, which explains why they are out in the middle of the Indian Ocean and out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in the Galapagos. So what does it mean to be a turtle? Well, I told you that there are cause for wonder, and I hope I've explained a lot of things that make them wonderful. And I want to tell you about the things that make them interesting, but also predisposed to the effects of human encroachment. In other words, predisposed to going extinct as a result of our spread around the planet and our impact on the environment and globalization. So 
Turtles have a suite of characteristics, what we call life history traits. And you know this as slowness, right? That's what you know this as, that make them, uh, that make them vulnerable, right? Life history theory and empirical studies suggest that they're bet hedgers, right? They do things slow and steady and continuously and repeatedly and over and over again. They hedge their bets. They're never going all their eggs in one basket. Just keep doing it. Keep living. Keep moving slowly, slowly, slowly. This is what most <coughs> turtles and tortoises behave like. And here's one of the most famous bet hedgers. This is Lonesome George. Did you all know that Lonesome George was for many, many, many decades even the last surviving member of his species, a uh, species from one of the islands in the Galapagos. And Lonesome George is interesting in that he's very different from a lot of other Galapagos tortoises because his species actually has this saddleback, which enables him to actually reach up and, and other members of his species or other members of similar species reach up and eat cactus pads because there's not a lot of grass for him to eat, so he reaches up and eats cactus pads. This shell is actually very thin, it's not very heavy. But Lonesome George was called Lonesome George because for decades there were no females around. And recently, because of molecular genetic technology, we've rescued some tortoises from a nearby island that have <coughs> significantly similar genotypes and we're hoping to rebreed them back to him so he'll be able to, or with him, so he'll be able to pass on his heritage this is kind of the same way we're doing it with the, um, the American elm, right? Using the Chinese elm to breed the, the elm blight out of the, of, the, of the species. So they've got these features, right? They have low nest survivorship. They have low but variable juvenile survivorship. They delay maturity tremendously. Some turtles don't mature until 30 years. But at some point when they get to a certain size, their survival is really high. Like adult turtles have higher survival than most other organisms. 95% annual survival or more. Maybe even up to 99%, right? But as we said, they don't ever put many eggs in one basket. They have low fecundity. But they are extremely interoperous. They, they breed over and over and over again for many years. And they have a long lifespan. And they have, unlike us, reduced or non-existent senescence. So female turtles will drop dead having babies, right? There's never any period of their life when they're not reproducing necessarily. So low clutch survivorship means that most nests look like this. Most nests don't make it. And delayed maturity means that an organism like this bog turtle, which might be 100 grams, takes as long to mature as this African elephant, about 13 to 20 year, years, right? So African elephants and bog turtles take about the same time to mature. But not all turtles do that. Remember the leatherback I was telling you about? Leatherbacks are more like mammals than they are like any other living turtle. So as soon as I give you an example, here's an exception. Leatherbacks are able to dive extremely deeply in the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean. They're known, they can swim to all parts of the globe. They're known to make polar forays after their favorite food, which are jellyfish. This is partly <coughs> because they are partly endothermic, homeothermic, that is, they're warm-blooded partly and able to regulate parts of their internal body temperature. This capacity also enables them to actually get huge, right? I've been in the water with them. Have you? I'm on the Gulf Coast, and they're really cool. <laughs> that's super, awesome. super I cool have animals. It. Yeah, that's incredible. But one of the things, Carl, that's so incredible about them being so big is because they are more like whales. They can control their internal body temperature, but their bone growth is far more like a mammal than it is like other sea turtles, another sea turtle, a reptilian type model. That's not to say that some turtles haven't gotten huge, right? Some of you heard about Titanoboa a couple years ago. Did you all hear maybe about this giant snake that they found in the coal mines or coal deposits of Colombia? 
and they used the size of that snake to actually determine that the temperatures, the environmental temperatures at the time must have been warmer in order to support an animal that large that was ectothermic. Well, Stu pandemis comes from a similar time period and is the largest known reptilian turtle that we know of from the north coast of South America, easily two meters long, a side neck turtle related to those side neck turtles that we were talking about. From about six million years ago, six or seven million year, years ago. And then the leatherback also has ancestors. And if you guys ever use, like when I was a kid, we had coloring books for dinosaurs. And this Archelon sea turtle was always in these coloring books, the giant sea turtle from 60 to 70 million years ago, which is much more like the leatherback, so much more mammalian. Turtles are able to survive, and they do it incredibly, right? They're able to survive in part because animals like box turtles, once they get to be a certain size, as we said, their shell protects them, but box turtles take it even further. Not only do their rib bones fuse, but they ankylose their rib bones further. So another layer of bone grows on top of their rib bones, which makes them actually able to survive predation attempts from most things except car wheels, right? <laughs> and most turtles can survive injuries that, that mammals would never be able to sustain, right? I mean, I study wood turtles, and this is a picture of a wood turtle that's lost its limb. Most mammals would never be able to sustain limb loss without some sort of intervention, and yet limb loss in turtles is common, and they continue to live and reproduce and grow old and be successful, more or less. And fire scarring and living through fire scarring is normal in turtles. This is a box turtle. I took this picture. It's a female. Notice that she's actually lost a limb. Notice that her shell is scarred completely. And what was she doing when we found her? Digging a nest. So along the way, turtles have some incredible adaptations. Not only they can they survive, one of the ways they can survive is because animals like this guy can actually breathe through their tongue. This was discovered last year, or was written about last year, that the papillae in the tongue of this little stink pot actually function the way gills do, right? In other words, oxygen will diffuse right into this surface and enable them to respire underwater. Those wood turtles actually do that as well. They can do it through their neck, highly vascularized place in their neck, and also through their cloaca. The one that has it down pat is this Mary River turtle, which has a giant tail, a giant tail, I mean, fully this long, and a giant cloaca, the urogenital opening, that's highly vascularized and enables it to breathe underwater for extended periods of time, even in waters that are not oxygen rich, warm water. Kind of easy to do it when the water's cold because it's full of oxygen. But when it's warm, it's harder. Turtles are able to do some pretty interesting things. We don't typically think of turtles as being very intelligent, but this is a photograph taken by a farmer, a guy named Kenny Lineweaver. This was probably the fifth or sixth year that this female had been returning to his porch every year in late May and early June to be fed by him. See his Adidas flip-flops there, either macaroni and cheese or buttered bread. And sometime, almost 20 years later, I got this picture from him and scanned it. Sometime, almost 20 years later, back about seven or eight years ago, we went and studied this population of turtles and found her doing the same thing. Found her returning to his house to be fed every May or June. And we identified her as the same animal in the picture because a, they told us and they were convinced, that's a start, but because of this scar on her carapace, because the scar on her carapace was exactly the same. Now here's something that's going to blow your mind. How many of you have heard of worm stomping? How many of you know that, for example, when it rains, worms come up, right? Well, birds are able to actually mimic the sound of raindrops and bring worms up. And when I was in Apalachicola sometime about 10 years ago, we stood in a circle, held, held hands, and we thumped our feet, and worms came up out of the ground. Okay. Well, uh, wood turtles can do it too. This isn't a great video, but it's, if you look closely, you'll see, whoops, 
can't get it, I'll show it to you at the end. Okay. I promise I'll show it to you at the end when we grab it. In any event, this turtle is actually thumping its shell against the ground in order to bring worms up. This has been documented both in captivity and in the wild. <coughs> I took that video, as I said, it's not great, but it shows that most recently we actually figured out that this is not, uh, uh, worms don't lead necessarily in response to raindrops, but the vibrations that a mole makes when it's moving through the ground. Wood turtles and many other turtles are able to actually buffer against the cold. Lots of times in the winter time when they're hibernating, the conditions will become anoxic. In other words, oxygen levels in the water will drop tremendously. But turtles are able to mobilize the calcium in their shells to buffer against the lactic acidosis process, to buffer against the lactic, build, lactic acid buildup. So you know when you get a charley horse, right? You know that feeling that's lactic acid buildup? You know how bad it hurts? Well, when turtles are living in anoxic or low oxygen conditions, they are respiring anaerobically and lactic acid builds up and it is toxic and they can buffer it by mobilizing the calcium that's in their shell into their bloodstream. And this enables them to do things which are pretty incredible like move around in one to two degrees C, like 34, 36 degrees Fahrenheit, move around in the stream just above freezing. Lots of turtles also have something called temperature dependent sex determination. In other words, they are able, or their eggs actually become male or female depending on certain pivotal temperatures that occur during certain parts of the incubation period. So, for example, if during the middle trimester, they go, the temperature in the nest goes above a certain temperature, the nest is going to produce all males. Or if it goes below that temperature, it's going to produce all females. In fact, there's also another pattern as well. But what's so interesting about this is that these common painted turtles have been demonstrated to be able to actually select the location of their nests, either out in the open or up against vegetation, in other words, <coughs> hidden and shaded, depending on their apparent perception of the uh, sex ratio in the population, such that they will apparently choose to produce offspring that are mostly those that are the less common sex. <coughs> now, turtles bet hedge even more than this, right? Because turtles can actually, females can actually store sperm and they do store sperm on a regular basis. And so females may be carrying the sperm from one individual male or multiple males for years, and they often use it to serially or sequentially actually fertilize given eggs in a clutch so that a single clutch of eggs will have multiple fathers. So they're bet hedging in lots of different ways. These guys from Australia, one of those snake neck turtles, are even stranger. They actually lay their eggs underwater during the rainy season, right? So they lay their eggs underwater, and those <coughs> eggs are bet hedging as well. They take it slow, too. They undergo diapause so that they don't <coughs> develop until water levels recede and they're exposed, and then they begin to develop, and they hatch out before the next rainy season, just in time for there to be rain for the hatchlings to live in these billabongs. So that's diapause. In chicken turtles, which are common to the southeastern United States, the chicken turtles leave the swamp and they estivate, that is they kind of hibernate for an extended period of time. They develop their eggs, they lay their eggs. Those eggs then undergo diapause until it rains. And then sometimes when water levels are low, the eggs themselves estivate for as long as 18 months before they hatch out. So they've extended that even further. So not only do the animals take it slow, the eggs take it slow. Right? And turtles we know are able to live long, long, long time. Right? So these are tortoises that we know that are nearly 200 years old. 
This one was 178 today, still alive. Darwin's tortoise recently died, I think three years ago, a tortoise that Darwin had. We recently took pictures of this box turtle from uh, southwestern Virginia that was sent to us, the Department of Game and Fisheries and myself, with uh, scribblings on the bottom of the shell, one part that says 1913. This is this year. <coughs> We've got these pictures from people that uh, found this turtle. So small little box turtles can live over 100 years. Uh, I visited Seychelles, and there was one particular turtle there. They claimed had lived more than 300 years. Is that possible? We, the, the, most of the records are hovering right around 200 years. It's possible, yeah, it is certainly possible. It's, the provenance of those tortoises in the Seychelles gets switched around, and there's so many stories about who they belong to that it's somewhat dubious. Okay, I've got a few minutes left before we have to wrap up, so I want to tell you a few more stories and also tell you about why turtles are a cause for concern. The other thing is, is that along the way of living this long time, they actually continue to grow and gain experience. And the, so the result, this is an important take home message, the result is that as they get older, they get a little bit bigger, their experience gets bigger, their reproductive output, that is the number of eggs they have and the size of the eggs they have goes up, their success of nests goes up, the hatchling survivorship goes up, all the while that the cost of reproduction to the individual female goes down. This means that if we want to conserve turtles, we need to be making sure that we, that we preserve the oldest ones. Some of the oldest ones are contributing the most to the success of the next generations. Normally we think of preserving the younger ones. As I said, we need to talk about why they are, or I'd like to talk about why they are cause for concern. If they were entirely extinct, we would consider them to be remarkable. But in fact, they are headed in that way. They are headed that way. Right? There is an emergent, it's not even emergent anymore, global turtle survival crisis. You probably don't have even a concept of this, but turtles are the most potentially endangered vertebrate group there is. Amphibians, which have several thousand species, are nearly as endangered. Turtles, which have several hundred species, 300, have about 40 to 50 percent of their species endangered with extinction. And it's because of those traits. It's because of those traits that they can't tolerate habitat loss. They don't respond quickly to habitat loss. They can't move. They don't change their habits. They don't respond to unsustainable use, harvesting for food and medicine. They can't change their habits. They can't respond well to disease, right? These populations can be wiped out very quickly. They certainly, we don't think, will respond well to rapid global or local climate change. They, in many places, are not responding well to invasive species. The entire coast of California, for example, where we have bullfrogs up until the last couple decades, and now the, the turtles that live there, their babies are just being decimated bullfrogs, which will fit anything into their mouth. Right. And of course, pollution. These factors are not different than they are for all of the many different groups of organisms that we're interested in preserving. But in fact, turtles, because of those traits, because they're bed hedgers, are not responding to changes in the, in the, in the, world, the way that some other organisms can. And it's worse because turtles are considered to be important sources of food and medicine for the emerging global tiger, China. Right? And so for the last two decades, the turtles that live in Southeast Asia have more or less disappeared. Disappeared such that now food markets and medicine markets for China reach all the way to the United States. And Southeastern United States, states in the Southeastern United States, have closed their, their open season on turtles down because the reach of those markets was so tremendous. There was so much money to be made by harvesting these turtles. And remember, they're not like fish. They don't reproduce a lot. They can't respond. <coughs> right. So as I said, nearly half are threatened with extinction, and at least 70% are on the verge of extinction. And over the, over the last 
decade, I've been involved with some important different attempts to promote global turtle conservation. One of the things we did beginning in 2003, we've done several different times, is point out the different turtles that are on what we call death row. We're not calling it death row anymore, but in fact, these guys are on the brink of extinction, including <coughs> animals like the bog turtle, which lives right here in the United States. And this is all the while happening. These nearly 50% of species are, all, are, are, are threatened all the while that we don't even know that much about turtles. We're discovering new species, we're making new discoveries, we're using molecular genetic techniques to actually elevate populations to species. So this guy was discovered in, in the northern part of Australia just a couple years ago. This guy was discovered in Sulawesi just about 10 years ago, right? This guy was discovered in Africa just, just five years ago. The Mary River turtle, the one that I was telling you with the giant cloaca, up until about 10 years ago was the only known from pet shops in Sydney. This guy was discovered in New Guinea. So all these places around the world where we're discovering new species, we're discovering new turtles, right? And we actually have some rediscoveries. This is a saw-shell turtle from Australia that was up until about 10 years ago only known from Pleistocene fossils several thousand years old. This, this is one of those Chinese turtles that I was telling you about that was, that was rediscovered three years ago, maybe four. And up until then, it was only known from records at the turn of the 20th century in museums. This guy was rediscovered in Burma in the last 10 years when Burma's opened up to research. Here's the Hone Kiam Lake Turtle, the world's largest soft shell. That soft shell is easily this big. Only known from a few zoos in China and the lake in the center of Hanoi. Protected Hanoi, Vietnam. Protected because of it, the mythology around that turtle. These soft shell turtles, now known from eastern India, were actually, before about seven years, about five years ago, only known from the Bastami Shrine in Chittagong, Bangladesh. This turtle was rediscovered in the Philippines just about five years ago. And this turtle was discovered in central Burma about seven years ago and is now critically in danger because the Burmese are sand mining in the rivers that, they, that it lives in, important sand mining, and they're putting dams right in those stretches of rivers where it lives in order to provide hydroelectric power. So as soon as we know that this thing exists, it's, it's critically important. And turtles provide, this is important to, to, to put this in perspective, because turtles provide important ecological services. Many different places around the world, turtles are the most abundant vertebrate in the niches they occupy. Right? And they are important components of the ecosystem they live in, if for no other reason than the services they provide directly, to people, like in Varnasi, for example, in Varnasi, India, you know, the place, one of the many different places where there are important uh, burial sites or sites where they burn people after they've died in a Hindu site, and there's lots of corpses in the Ganges River. Well, one of these turtles, Nilsonia gangetica, was actually used several different times over the last couple decades in breeding programs to control these corpses, that is to, to, to feed on these corpses, and that would be an important part of the ecological system. <clears throat> and of course, turtles have been important symbols, right? They've been important symbols to us all along, right? Oracle bones from nearly 4,000 years ago in the Shang Dynasty of China, right? Turtles as important symbols to the aboriginals in Australia. Some petroglyphs with turtles in Australia are dated over 10,000 years old, maybe even 20,000 years old. Turtle rattles from, from uh, here in North America. I'm actually gonna work on some, some, some turtle pieces from digs that uh, Dr. Bates is working on here in the Virginia area. Uh, friezes or uh, petroglyphs, not petroglyphs, excuse me, but architecture with turtles in it from Persia turtles guarding the forbidden city in China, right? So the hot spots where we might protect turtles, and I'll wrap this up now, are Southeastern Asia, and or South Asia, and Southeastern United States. So 
for the Ganges, Brown, Kutra Basin of India, India and Bangladesh, one of the places we've identified as a critical hotspot of turtle diversity. And surrounding it are global hotspots of biodiversity, Himalayas and Indo-Burma. And we are attempting to identify places to protect the turtles that live in that area. The problem with this area is even though it has extraordinary biodiversity, it is also one of the places around the planet with extraordinary human footprint. So lots of work needs to be done <coughs> there in order to provide services to people and to the regional biodiversity. One of the things we can do is focus our efforts here in the United States, here in the southeastern United States. Here we have 58 different species in five different families. Here where we have another global hotspot of turtle diversity in several different ecoregions. Here in the Farmville area where we have anywhere from eight to 10 different species right outside of our back door. That's right. So I'll close with this fable by extension is allegory, right? In that turtles may not be able to survive all the changes that we are bringing to, the, to this planet so quickly. They've been able to survive all of these massive changes over the last 200 million years. And that suggests to me that even though nearly 50% of them are extinct now, one important symbolic consideration is that maybe we are the hair. <laughs> <coughs>
And th that's, that's an example of a turtle that matures very quickly. It's, it lives in lots of different conditions naturally, and so spreads very readily, and is <coughs> found all over the globe now, right? It's, it's, an, it's a counter example to all of the things that I said were components of the standard uh, turtle lifestyle, you know, being very narrowly restricted. These guys are found in Europe and Asia, everywhere. The, they, the, you know, they, they are actually wild in China now. So that would be, that would be an example of an animal that, that may live through the, through the, the, uh, the sixth mass extinction. Uh, are there any new laws to protect uh, these endangered, endangered species? Uh, are the Chinese doing anything about it? The Chinese are, are doing an extraordinary amount about it, considering um, the fact that they, they are only second to us in terms of being a, a mega diverse country for turtles, right? So right after the United States comes China in terms of the number of species within a, within a geopolitical boundary. And uh, they don't really have much in the way of wild turtle populations anymore, but they have significantly reduced the amount of importation of wild species and, and they've protected virtually all of their remaining native <coughs> populations. Partly because in the last several decades, turtle farming has become so prolific in China. And so, so popular and so capable. And that's, that's primarily because, and I didn't go into this because it's a whole other story, the Chinese and in general, some Asian traditional medicines see turtles as symbols of virility. And so there is one particular species from southern China and Vietnam that they have traditionally ground up into a jelly for the purpose of virility in males, right? So males take this the same way that you would take Viagra. And so the, the, you know, the kind of campaign that we've been on for the last decade is if only we could get Viagra more widely spread in China, <laughs> maybe turtles would not be doing so poorly. <laughs> Well, uh, bullfrog is one classic example of, of <coughs> invasive species. What are you thinking of in, in particular? Uh, just anything. I'm sort of generally interested in invasive species, things like the zebra mussels in the Mississippi and that kind of thing. I wonder what kind of issues face turtles. The bullfrog example is probably the, the most classic example of an invasive predator coming into a system that didn't already have a predator on that, let's say, uh, life history stage. Bullfrogs can, can fit hatchling turtles in their mouth, and there are lots of turtles that didn't <coughs> grow up, so to speak, with those predators. But there are, there are many different kind of theoretical examples that I could think of where invasive plants might exclude natives that they might all otherwise eat if it weren't for the invasive species, things like that. I can't, off the top of my head, think of other, other better, more recent. Yes? Bob, what do crows? Oh yeah, they, that. <coughs> oh yeah. So that I think of crows <coughs> as, or ravens more specifically, as subsidized. More, they are invasive because they've spread all throughout the desert southwest, but they've been subsidized by people. In other words, power lines and trash or trash hump dumps or roadkill have subsidized the spread of ravens. And the same thing has happened. That spread has enabled ravens <coughs> to prey on baby desert tortoises where they wouldn't have been eaten. Thank you. Perfect point. Yes. What's the outlook for the box turtle in southeastern uh, America, around here, for example? Uh, do things sort of disappear? They have. You're absolutely right. So, you know, there are several different groups in the eastern United States that are interested in preservation of box turtles, and uh, I'm actually reviewing a paper right now that, that where they have the the folks at VCU and a couple different institutions have collected box turtles out of newly developed housing developments in southeastern Virginia, and then lay, let them lay their eggs, started raising them and their hatchlings in pens in order to keep them from trying to disperse or home into new regions. 
so that they can potentially repatriate these animals to a new place that's protected. So th there are technologies that are being developed. They're not a solution. They're just halfway solutions. But yes, box turtles, you know, one of the most abundant turtles there are, are now in, not in great shape. Well, Tom, your talk, Turtles, a Cause for Wonder, a Cause for Concern, <clears throat> perfectly titled. Thank you very much. <laughs> Week, Robin Smith is going to talk to us about being literate in a digital world, so please hope to see you in a week. Thank you for coming. <laughs>